Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Mineral Live. Jordan Rocha here, and today we're gonna to be looking at the BMW iX, looking at the underbody. I can tell you before we get into it, uh, there's a lot of things that are very BMW-esque, and that's not always a good thing, so I'll show you what a few of those things are as we go through. But there's no shortage of aluminum, and uh, they did some kind of interesting stuff. So to get started, um, as we start looking at the underbody here, my boss, Scott Hildreth, actually took this out, and he's got a substantial amount of experience in terms of driving very nice vehicles that perform very well in terms of NVH, ride and handling, so on and so forth. And he said, and I quote, it is one of the quietest and most subdued vehicles he's ever driven, meaning it absorbs the noise perfectly. Going over a pothole, it is very, very quiet. Um, so that's good feedback. Now, a few enablers that, that would help with that looking under the vehicle. So one, it's got air suspension. So if you look up here, I now have a laser pointer on me so I can kind of point this out. They've got air struts. So it's adaptive air suspension, front and rear. And it is a virtual ball. Um, so S, so short arm, long arm. So the top, of the, con the top control arm is shorter than the lower control arm, which helps keep the wheel more vertically oriented relative to the vehicle um, as it goes through its travel. And virtual ball means that these two control arms right here, so I've got the lower and then um, what could be considered the te tension or compression link depending on um, the load movement. Those are tying in here. And virtual ball means that if you were to make a straight line from this point to this point, and then the same with the forward control arm and follow those out, wherever those intersected, it's called the virtual ball. So it's where the, where the geometry would actually rotate about. So that gives you, that actually changes the, the virtual position of the tire patch. So you get some better characteristics out of driving um, feedback there. We've got front steer. So front steer, generally speaking, gives you better characteristics when getting off the line quickly, going through corners. It helps stabilize the wheel uh, more so than a rear steer. So uh, most of your high performance applications are gonna opt for front steer. Um, all of the links, upper, lower, uh, front and rear, to include the, uh, the tie rod outer, everything's forged aluminum as far as what I'm seeing here, including the knuckle, which is a, a long arm knuckle, and even the brake shield, which is protecting this, this fixed caliper um, likely Brembo or Akebono, some uh, a supplier like that, um, high performance caliper, it's protecting that. So good on BMW, they're protecting the line, they're protecting the paint. So as a customer, um, that, that's not a bad thing to do. Looking at the subframe, it's mostly aluminum extrusions. So it, it's very similar to um, some of the other startups in terms of architecture. Right, like the Rivian, like the first Model S, whereby it is mostly extruded aluminum. Now, I think BMW did a much more eloquent job at bringing all of these extrusions together. Um, there is less welding, generally speaking, less components. We're seeing nice swept geometry at the front of the vehicle, especially in the SORB region. Uh, by SORB, I mean small overlap rigid barrier. So IHS conducts a impact test, which engages 25% of the total width of the vehicle, right? So there's, there's a lot of impact events that result in roughly 25% of the vehicle being impacted. And so as a result, a lot of the OEMs are implementing SORB countermeasures. So BMW, what they did to mitigate that or enable better performance from a crash worthiness perspective, they brought the subframe or the cradle, which is hard mounted to the body into that 25% zone. As you look upward in vehicle, right? I'll try and highlight it with my laser pointer here. This black member right here is actually the bumper beam. So both the bumper beam and the cradle, and then actually above that, the upper load beam, or what we would refer to as the shotgun, are all in that 25% zone. So really, they've got three load paths as you go vertically in the vehicle that are gonna help absorb that energy and dissipate that um, within the vehicle structure before you're actually getting to the occupant home 
um, where, where the driver and passengers are going to reside. So interesting strategy. To me, it does look more like it's a defensive package. When you put this much stuff up front, they're really trying to get the vehicle off and away from the barrier before you ultimately reach stack up back at the, the torque box, which is this region of the vehicle here, meaning where the wheel and the tire and all of those things sort of start to collapse up against this region of the vehicle. So they're just trying to deflect versus just absorb all of that energy. So I, I, I'm in favor, generally speaking, of the offensive package. Um, so I'd really be interested to see how this thing crash. A couple of interesting th things that I notice when looking a little bit further upward in vehicle, not just looking at the cradle, but looking at the rail system here, right? So I'm talking about this member and how the drive motor unit is attached to it. So this can that I'm trying to highlight here with the laser pointer houses the isolator for the drive unit. So the primary, what we would refer to as the longitudinal rails, the four aft structures in the vehicle, they're pushing in the isolators for the drive units on the left and right hand side of the vehicle. So they're actually, they're, they're putting a hole in that load path. Yes, they're putting a ring back in it, they're welding it in. So they're not losing a ton of structure, but, but generally speaking, that's a little bit of a risky move in terms of your crash worthiness. That's gonna require a lot of validation, um, a lot of uh, both virtual and physical, a, a lot of work to make sure that that thing is gonna perform and do what it needs to do from a, what I would say, a vehicle pulse index perspective. So it's both the, the curve of the acceleration during the event and not just the curve in terms of amplitude, but over unit time. So how much energy are you observing as the occupants over unit time during a frontal impact? So it's VPI, Vehicle Pulse Index. Every time you modify something on a primary crash structure like that, like the longitudinal, you have to manage um, all of those characteristics. You know, we've seen people do testing and crash the exact same vehicle three, four, five times and get different acceleration value results in every vehicle, exact same car. So these things are, are difficult to, predi to predict. They're getting much better with all the virtual modeling, CAE and so forth. Um, but it's interesting that they made that choice versus hanging the mount off the side of the rail. They actually put it inside of the rail. So in theory, it allows more space in the Y direction and width um, to package the motor or the drive unit. But there's the trade-offs, as I was just mentioning from a crash worthiness perspective, that, that you gotta manage and just know that you're validating properly. One of the things that I saw that kind of made me smile when I looked under this, that's very BMW-esque, as I was mentioning at the beginning, is if you look at the bottom of this fork, so this is the base of the front suspension um, strut. So it's got the air, air, air shock and strut and the fork, We've got the half shaft coming through here. If you notice right where my finger's at, it's machined out. And I'm like, well, it's a forged piece. And yeah, I see they've got some machining. But if you look at the profile of it, it perfectly mirrors the geometry or, or the profile of this control arm in front of it. And so BMW took such a tight packaging and uh, clearance approach that they actually carved out that control or this this fork on the lower portion of the strut to mirror the control arm so that they could still maximize the turning radius, right? You get to your full steering stop um, and they get the control arm exactly where they want it so that you get the most efficient load path in terms of the suspension characteristics. So uh, in a future iteration, they may leave that as forged, right? So this is like the BMW. I wouldn't recommend machining that out because it's extra cost it's time intensive, so on and so forth. I would try and get that geometry or a, a larger portion of it in the forging itself. Um, but it is, it is a difficult geometry to manage, but maybe in a future iteration of this vehicle, that would be as forged versus machined out separately. So just some interesting things. And then here, I noticed that they have an open hole in this lower control arm where nothing goes to it. So to me, that indicates that perhaps this control arm is carryover from a different vehicle program whereby the 
sway bar or the stabilizer bar right here, this link would attach to the lower portion of this control arm versus where it does right now, which is up on the strut right there. So it's a blank hole, but if I were BMW, I would say, well, if you're not using it, don't machine it, uh, don't cut a hole in it, just leave it as forged and it'll save some cost. Granted, I know it's common. It may just be simpler to say, you know what? We'll just take some from that batch, but um, just something interesting, right? When you talk about sort of bespoke or niche vehicles like this would probably be considered to be, you may end up with some weird stuff like that as they're sort of adapting components from other programs um, to support this one. So overall on the underside of this vehicle, um, separate from suspension, you're seeing a ton of aluminum shielding. This is probably every bit of three millimeters. This is a stamped aluminum shield. Um, they, they took a pretty concerted effort to not just protect the battery pack, but also with how high this steering rack motor is tucked up above the nominal surface of the structures. BMW is really trying to make sure that they're protecting all of the critical elements in the vehicle. If you had seen the bolt underbody review, you'd see that I was pointing out a few of the high voltage monuments at the leading edge of the pack that were relatively exposed from a frontal impact perspective, uh, right? You, you imagine if there's an, a muffler sitting in the road and you happen to drive over it, you don't see it. You're really exposing some of those things, which in theory could cause a thermal management issue. If you sever the wire, the cable, and you get a, you get a short, you, you could run into some issues. If nothing else, you could certainly um, be sort of stranded, right? If you can't get power to and from your battery, you're in trouble. Um, so one thing before we move further rearward in the vehicle, BMW has done this. If you've seen any of the other BMW reviews, you would see, I, I always kind of point this out because I always thought it was fascinating and sort of an interesting approach. This is an aero shield that lives just in front of the wheel envelope. So it's the zone in which the tire resides. Um, they do this, what I would call dual shot, right? So this is a harder material right here. And then locally around this, this bulbous form at the leading edge of the tire, they're making this out of like EPDM more than likely. And so what that allows them to do is carry the, the envelope, right? The, the airstream down and around the, the wheel envelope so as to minimize drag. Right, so it's improving vehicle efficiency overall. But the interesting thing on this one is that they put this little flap here. So to me, this looks like a passive flap. So um, at higher speeds, they may wanna let some air through there. Um, at lower speeds, they may wanna block it off. But by putting these holes here and by putting this passive flap here, what they're mitigating is this being packed up with stones, rocks, debris, snow, what have you. Um, so just, it's sort of an iteration on a previous execution that they've done, like I'd mentioned for a decade or a decade or more. So interesting to see that they're kind of evolving as they go through. And then they had a, uh, it looks like an ambient air temperature sensor put right here. So interesting spot to pick up temperature, but if you want a true ambient temp as heat rises, it's not a bad spot to place it thermally, I suppose, but uh, interesting spot to put that. So you can see the backside of it right here. This little guy right there. Okay. All right, we can move rearward. So the battery pack, uh, much like many of the battery electric vehicles that we look at, it looks like um, either stamped or extruded aluminum across the whole base of the pack. Um, and then for sure on the side members, you're seeing extruded aluminum sections TIG welded to the base floor of the pack. And then also without getting inside the pack, I would probably, I would bet money that right here where I'm kind of tracing with my fingers, they've got some cross members in shrub pack that are TIG welded. Cause what we're seeing are the lines, the, those are read through lines, um, whether it's uh, due to burn through the welding process um, and or if this is thin enough, you'll get, you'll get physical read through or detents from those cross members coming down. I think the only thing that really stood out for me on the underside of this pack was if you look at the sill sections of the pack, we've got all of these plastic plugs. When I first looked at them, I'm like, oh wow, they're, they're battery vents, right? So that the battery can um, 
the, the battery space can actually vent out to the atmosphere. But after looking at them a second time, I'm like, wait a second, that sill doesn't actually go within the battery cavity. And so the only thing that I can think of when looking at this is that they put those holes um, there so that they could mount the pack, right? So underneath here, I would bet that there are fasteners that are the primary attachment points for the pack to the body structure. But then they actually went through the effort of putting dedicated injection molded plugs into every single one of those, um, which are probably from both a debris perspective and from an aero perspective to keep it nice and slippery underneath the vehicle. Um, the only other thing that I always appreciate about BMWs is they did take a concerted effort for the lifting points to actually carve out where the pad on the lift would go, right? So they actually um, machined this out of the extrusion so as to leave you a dedicated point to drop a lift under. Okay, now we can move rearward. The other, one of the other reasons that this vehicle is giving some pretty good driving dynamics as far as like what I had mentioned Scott was talking about is that they actually have rear steer on this vehicle. So this like darker colored cast aluminum um, member right here, there's actually a steering motor just rearward of it. I can use the laser pointer. So this, this whole monument right here, that's a, think of it like a little baby steering rack, similar to what you would have in the front. And that's connected to your tow links, your rear tow links. And so a lot of these, like I know the Audi Q7, Q8, e-tron had, um, and way before that, even like the GMC Denali, the trucks, they used to have rear steer. Um, what that gives you is a tighter turning circle at slow speeds. So you can really, really tuck in uh, if you're in a parking lot or if you're parallel parking, something like that. So you get much tighter turning circle um, at low speeds. And then at high speeds versus having the front and the rear wheels turn opposite ways, at high speeds, they will actually turn the same way. And so it'll give you the, as the driver, it'll give you the sensation that you're not turning, right? The vehicle doesn't want to roll, but that it actually just kind of glides to the left or glides to the right. So, um, sweet dance moves. thank you. Eric said I have sweet dance moves. It's the first and last time I'll ever hear that. Um, so in any case, uh, not super novel it's more just a cost decision are you willing to pay for the improved driving dynamics or not one small thing if you're wondering what this little blue knob is here um, not many vehicles are without these but what that is is a mass damper so they throughout the course of their testing uh, nvh assessments so on and so forth they found that they had some sort of a vibration or a mode that they could not cancel out easily without putting simply some extra mass with a tuned isolator or the elastomer um, that is holding this weight in place. The only thing that I'm, you know, as far as mass dampers go, that is quite an expensive mass damper simply because one, it almost appears as though it's heat treated because it's blue and yellow, right? You, you can see that there's witnesses of heat treat, but two, that it's machined, so it's actually turned on a lathe. So if you're gonna do a mass damper, many people will just use a cast iron or like a lead base, right? Something that has mass, but not very expensive to manufacture or purchase for that matter. But so to use a machined steel piece, maybe that's another one of those BMW things. I'm not sure. Looking at the underside of the rear cradle, I'll give you a brief overview. So we've got, um, cast aluminum nodes or sides of the cradle. So it's, it's the primary nodes where all the control arms are gonna link up to and attach to. Um, it's, you know, the portions that attach to the body structure itself above the cradle are going through castings on the cradle. Um, and then going from side to side, and then also fore aft in a few spots, they're putting extruded aluminum. So, not again not too novel there we've seen rivian do it we've seen land rover do it we've seen audi do it a lot of people execute things similar to this but one thing that's interesting here is that if you remember looking at the rear cradle in the rivian we were talking about how 
it had pockets in the subframe. Maybe Eric, if you swing over here, you could see it better. We're talking about pockets in the subframe where the half shaft, which I'm highlighting right now, can pass through the cradle structure. So it's this hoop right here. Um, the Rivian cast the whole thing, right? They cast the pocket um, and then they fed the half shaft through. BMW elected to make these, the lower portion of that, that hoop, extruded aluminum, and then they're bolting it in place to the cradle. So just like Rivian, they're getting some torsional benefits from that. Um, it's stiffening up this, this whole rear member. Um, but the nice part about bolting those in, although generally at Monroe, we advise strongly against fasteners. Um, this allows you to both, if you needed to, both service and install these separate from, or, or with the half shafts or separate from the half shafts, however you want to say it. I don't need to uh, drop the entire cradle or do something crazy here because now I can unbolt that and I've got clearance to drop things vertically or in the Z axis if need be. So again, I wouldn't advise generally speaking about adding parts or adding fasteners, but there are pros and cons to something like this. Now, um, as far as attachment to the battery pack, they, they are doing what I would call a double shear bracket or reinforcement between the cradle and the battery pack. So yeah, Eric, Eric if you loop around. So this stamp steel bracket right here, um, the fastener for the, the subframe, the leading edge of the subframe on the rear, the bolts are going through this double shear bracket, through an isolated uh, member on the rear cradle and into the body structure. And then the forward edge of that bracket are going through the battery, the, the, some of the extruded portions on the battery, and into the body structure. So they're really tying the three major monuments together, being the cradle, the battery structure, and the body structure. So there's some benefits here. Local joint stiffness when you do double shear, meaning you're attaching it at the top edge of the, the you know, there's a big can about this big on the cradle. When you're, when you're securing it at the top and at the bottom, locally that becomes stiffer and um, helps you tune your suspension, so on and so forth. Uh, we've seen other folks do that, not novel, but um, just a decision. I think probably the, the last point here that I would wanna bring up, and this you know could be supplier driven if they're buying their drive module off the shelf, uh, or if BMW just was being more conservative at the end of their design cycle. The oil pan for the lower edge of the drive unit is injection molded. And so we've seen people do that great. Low, lower weight, you get a lot of feature integration. Uh, you can mold in seals, do all sorts of things. Um, but they negated some of those benefits the moment that they bolted on I, I, I'm not joking, I'm pretty sure that's at least four millimeters thick um, stamped aluminum uh, or, or perhaps it's zinc plated steel, I'd have to throw a magnet on it. But nonetheless, it's an extremely thick bracket and they put an NVH pad on the bottom. So kind of negated the benefits of going with injection mold there. But again, it could be that they're using a off the shelf or pre-existing drive unit for the vehicle. So all in all, looking at the vehicle, uh, there's some things that they did great from a dynamics perspective, certainly speaks to what Scott was saying that they've got excellent driving characteristics in the vehicle, but um, they're certainly spending a fair amount of money to get there, right? Between the aluminum, uh, the steering units, the air suspension, so on and so forth. There's a lot of dollars and cents baked into the underside of this vehicle. So rest assured, if you're paying 104 grand, most of it's on the underside. Um, so that being said, if you are interested in some of our reports, uh, we're in the middle of the Model Y teardown. That report should be available roughly October 1st. Um, in addition to uh, the Plaid, the Rivian, right? All of these are going to be available very shortly. Please reach out at sales at leandesign.com. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.